Please rise as you are able for our call to worship. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on God's name. Sing praises to the one who hears the cries of the hungry. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Generous God, you provide for all our needs. If we but put our trust in you, when the Israelites were hungry in the wilderness and began to complain, you gave them bread in the form of manna to eat in the morning and quail to satisfy their hunger in the evening. You gave just enough to be consumed with gratitude and trust. Generous God, help us to give with generosity this morning, with gratitude for all we have received from your goodness, and with trust in your faithfulness. We pray in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. And now in humility and faith, let us confess our sins silently before God. Hear the good news in Jesus Christ. We have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Know that we are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks be to God.
As forgiven and reconciled people, let us share with one another the peace of Christ. The peace of Christ be with you. The Sinai Wilderness is what we're going to be reading about today, but first of all, please join me in the prayer for illumination. Blessed are you, God of all creation. You spoke and your word came to live with us, full of grace and truth. As your word is spoken afresh today, may all we hear lead us to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Sinai Wilderness is a foreboding place. A multi-year journey to a new home you have never seen is a daunting prospect. The past is secure and unchanging. The future is unknown and variable. In our scripture lesson today from Exodus, a passage sometimes called the murmuring in the wilderness, the Israelites complained to Moses and Aaron that their life as slaves in Egypt was better than their present life in the wilderness. At least back then, they could count on their captors giving them food. God hears their complaints. God gives them bread on the surface of the ground and the miraculous manna in the wilderness. Hear these words from Exodus chapter 16, verses 2 through 15. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare for what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we? that you complain against us. And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but it's against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, 
and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine, flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. And when the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? for they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. The word of the Lord. Please rise for a reading from the Gospel of Matthew. I want to remind our kindergartners through third graders that today is a click Sunday, children learning in Christ's kingdom, and that after the Gospel reading, you can line up here at the left uh, door here and be guided out to go with Miss Melissa. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 20. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into the vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those who had been hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last workers only, uh, worked only an hour, and you have made them equals to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Do you not agree with me for the usual daily did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? 
Take whatever belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same amount as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. may be seated. Every Click Sunday, I'm reminded of the joy of our children that we are blessed with in our congregation. I'm, a, I'm especially thankful, I think I was thinking give thanks, because in seminary, one of the things that, you know, our professors might say to us is be as simple so as that children might even understand. Thankfully, they're no longer with us, at least all of them that I would be speaking to. Because this is the fear of many of us pastors, is that we might remain in the clouds of ideology and theology, and so as to ponder the mysteries of the universe, the metaphysical realities in which we live, and even articulate what it looks like to live a life according to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in so doing, fail entirely to connect simply to our everyday lives. Every time I step before you all in this pulpit, I ask myself, does this make sense? Well, let me rephrase that a little bit. I ask Ashley, my wife, does this make sense? Because she faithfully listens to every one of my sermons before I get up on Sunday morning. So if you ever want to know what I'm preaching about, you can ask her over coffee and know whether or not you should go get coffee instead of listening, right? <laughs> but down to earth, living in God's creation... Now, this should be a sermon series that doesn't fail to connect with our everyday living. We are living on earth, after all. Yet here we are with our two scripture readings this morning, one of a miraculous event in the wilderness, and the other a riddled description of the kingdom of God. Welcome to the world within the Bible, an often unfamiliar world, one that's difficult to understand, difficult to hear God speaking through at times, and difficult to learn simple, practical, applicable messages for our lives. Unfortunately for you all, I'm not going to give you an explanation of the Bible, the one answer we might be looking for. I'm not going to tell you that manna was likely the excretion of bugs in the Sinai Peninsula, who ate all the sap from the trees, or that the greatest theologian's description of the parable that we have today. I don't want to do that, because I'm afraid that I might allow you to fall into the temptation of thinking there is one way to interpret the Bible. This is what our sermon series, Down to Earth, is about. There are themes throughout the Bible, a multiplicity of themes that we're supposed to delve into and explore and one of the most central themes from beginning to end is a theme of creation as a part of, and how we're supposed to live with creation as a part of our lives of faith. The role that dirt plays in our faith. The way death and sacrifice form us as disciples. And the way we're supposed to care for the air, the rivers, and all the creeping, crawling, swimming, and flying creatures of this world. 
It's what we've been talking about the past few weeks. So for a moment, let's shelf our desire to understand that one truth, the one mystery that is to be unfolded within the scriptures, and let's imagine with the people of Israel in the wilderness. For while both passages this morning seem to be so distant from our everyday living, both passages are about the most practical reality in which we live. On one hand, there is food, and on the other hand, it's work. Almost all of us have to do that. All of us have to do that. Even the children, they say, play is their work. The problem, however, is that we as Christians, well, we like to disconnect our faith from these practical realities. Although we long for someone to give us practical steps how to live our faith, faith often becomes immaterial about relationships or our spiritual salvation or about the extra things that we do on top of our lives to help those in need. As Christians, we do not think that changing our eating practices and the way we work is often integrally tied to our lives as disciples. The very notion of changing our eating habits is strange to us. To not eat pig, to only eat at dawn or dusk for a season of the year, to not eat cow. Well, this is what other traditions do and not what we do. We've grown apart from these rules like kosher and halal, these guidelines and these principles that govern this essential component to our lives. Other than communion, I doubt that many of us see food literally as food from God. That how we eat is tied directly to how we follow Jesus, to faithful discipleship. But throughout the Bible, we're given a lot about how we eat, about where we eat, with whom we eat. This is, like creation, one of the central themes throughout Scripture, eating. And here in Exodus, I think, we're given a glimpse into some of the basic principles that God wants to entrench in our daily lives around eating. We have a story of a people who are freed from slavery and who are desperately hungry, wandering in the wilderness, complaining to God for food. And what does God and God's love do for these people that were complaining after being freed? But feed them. God makes sure that all of the hungry Israelites have enough. And in this phrase, I see two basic principles. All of God's people had enough. And all God's people had enough. You're not crazy. I did just repeat myself, but there's two ways of hearing that phrase. God's people all had enough. Everyone was able to eat their fill. And God's people had enough. Not an overabundance, not enough to store, not more than enough to store for that rainy day, the extra in the freezer that they can take out whenever they want, but enough. As many of you know, I spent a year in Japan after graduating from undergrad, and I learned a lot of life lessons through the cultural differences between Japan and America. But one of the lessons I learned revolved directly around food. It wasn't just the new food that I was eating, although there were some new experiences to say the least, whether it was the giant tuna head that I got to eat or the live minnows. But over time, it was the portion size, especially the portion size of meat, that changed my perspective on food. Granted, many of my meals were the same meals that the middle schoolers were eating, a bowl of rice, um, some pickled vegetables, a little bit of fish, and a drink and maybe perhaps a dessert, very small dessert. The entrees were small, the pizzas were small, the cakes were small, everything was small and the meat was small. I felt like I was ordering an extra meal and a half every time we went out. When me and my American friends would sit down at a restaurant, they would know we should probably expect for them to order multiple appetizers and their meal. It took a while for us to get used to those portion sizes. 
But what struck me was when I came back from Japan and I brought some of my friends that I had made from Japan with me and we sat around the dinner table at one of those restaurants, probably something like the Cheesecake Factory, and they looked at the meal in front of them and said, Sugoi, Cho Sugoi. And they looked at that 12 ounce slab of beef and said, Cho Sugoi, big, very big. Oh my goodness, I can't believe how big this is. I couldn't disagree with them at all. In Japan, I came to realize what I had been begun to learn in college, that the eating practices of many Americans relied heavily on large portions of meat and large portions in general. Now, I'm a good old Minnesota boy, so meat and potatoes was my way of life growing up. But when I got back from Japan, I was skeptical as to whether or not I needed that much food especially of meat. In America, we like whatever we want, whenever we want it, in large amounts, as cheap as possible, and it doesn't matter what season it is in, we will get it shipped in from wherever it is in season. The more you buy and the more you save. <laughs> My time in Japan was completely different than that. The grocery stores were driven by the seasons of the year, and it was this crazy thing that the more you bought didn't mean the more you saved. One soda felt like the same as 12 sodas. One pound of beef, the same as three pounds of beef. Yet here we are, and fast forward a few years, and I am pastor of mission and evangelism here at University United Methodist Church. And one of the things that I have said multiple times to this congregation is that here in Orange County, one in four children, perhaps even one in three children, are food insecure here in Orange County. There are certainly many in our country that eat more than enough, but there are many in our country who don't have enough, who don't especially have enough nutritious food. Neighborhoods, primarily lower income neighborhoods, have gas stations with no produce where they can buy fresh fruits and vegetables. No full service grocery stores in some communities and other areas, it's cheaper to eat at McDonald's than to make a nutritious meal. Something is sinfully amiss in our nation and in our world when the problem of food and hunger and food insecurity is coupled with overindulgence. When people say that the problem of hunger isn't tied to how much food there is in the world, but tied to disbursement and availability. And it's in the midst of this systematic problem that I turn back to our passage from Exodus this morning. The Israelites and manna and quail. All were given enough. All got food, but all were given enough. No one had the extras in their closets and pantries and in the freezers to store over except for on Sabbath. To live with enough, to share with all who are hungry, this is a theme throughout the Bible early Jewish farming practices, they would leave just enough in their farm for the poor to come through and to glean enough food to survive. Fresh produce for the poor. Paul, the Apostle Paul, speaking to the Corinth in this division between the rich and the weak, was talking to them, why do you eat meat around the poor who can't afford it? He chastises them, don't eat meat because these can't afford it with you unless you're going to share it with them. The unity of the body of Christ, what we will declare in the baptism of William later this morning, is that God loves all of us. This grace extends to all of us. God's intent for everyone is that we all have enough food to thrive and to grow into that image of God that is within us, that image of Jesus Christ. This is what unity means. It requires that we all have enough the problem, however, is that the more you know, the more daunting this task becomes. Sure, we can donate to table, we can participate in Stop Hunger Now events, we can give to the IFC and cook in the kitchen, but the more you know about our food systems, the more you realize how systematic this problem really is. 
For those of you who have watched Food, Inc., you know what I'm talking about, that food injustice in our nation is tied to our cultural practices or our monocrop. It's tied to how much meat we eat. It's tied to our genetically modifying and copywriting seeds. It's a big problem. But here I am, up in the clouds again, on an ideological rant talking about the challenge that's before us. And I can give you things that you can do. I can tell you to eat at the farmer's market. I can tell you to come to the community garden tonight at 5 to help work on the garden. And hopefully we'll begin to uh, connect to people on SNAP benefits that they might learn how to make nutritious food for themselves. But let's keep it simple. Let's keep it down to earth for a moment. And let's follow these two principles that God gives us in Exodus. All God's people had enough, and all God's people had enough. If we're going to change our practices, our systemic problems, we need to change our individual practices. We need to eat differently. So, in the spirit of what we might learn from our Israelite brothers and sisters in the past, and what I've learned from my friends from Japan, I want to invite us all to eat a little less the coming couple weeks. Think about it. We worship about 600, 600 people each Sunday. If we, each of us, eat one less can of food each week, that's about 1,200 cans of food. That means that's uh, probably a little bit more than 600 pounds, probably more like 800 pounds, and that feeds two kids every weekend for the rest of the year, or more than that. If you don't eat two cans throughout the next two weeks, we can feed kids. And so here on World Communion Sunday, October 5th, and two Sundays from now, we'll come and we'll bring our cans of food here to the altar. But the simple principle of eating enough so that others might eat enough. How easy is that? To live into the body of Christ, to make sure that all might thrive and grow. Give all God's people enough. Give yourselves enough. Amen.
may be seated. As you're seated, I invite you to turn in your hymnal to page 39 as we begin the sacrament of holy baptism. Brothers and sisters in Christ, throughout through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We're incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All of this is a gift given to us without price. Anne and Paul Clark come to bring their second son, William Henry, to be baptized. William Henry, who is yawning and hopefully mm -hmm. will stay awake for this. <laughs> Anne and Paul, I ask these questions on behalf of the whole church that you answer on behalf of your son. Do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin, do you? Do you accept the freedom and power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves, do you? Do you confess Jesus Christ is your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races, do you? <laughs> and will you nurture this child in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to profess his faith openly, and to lead a Christian life, will you? I will. Do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include William now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround William with a community of love and forgiveness that he may grow in his service to others. We will pray for him that he may be a true disciple who walks in the way that leads to life. Let us join together in professing the Christian faith that's contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, who has conceived by the Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit. Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal God, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. And after the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of God's mercy each day. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Declare his works to the nations, his glory among all the people. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and he who receives it to wash away his sin and clothe him in righteousness throughout his life that dying and being raised with Christ, he may share in Christ's final victory. All praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen.
and just whispered and said, he fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> what name is given this child? William Henry Clark, we baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Holy Spirit work within you that being born of water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. This is a little angel. Brothers and sisters, I introduce to you William Henry Clark, your new brother in Christ. When families stand with their children at the baptismal font, we stand with them. They make the promise to raise the child in the faith. When William's older brother was baptized before that, his father, Paul, was baptized. His father and mother stepping forward, making sure that they made the promises to God, that they then promised to raise their children toward making. This family has promised to surround this child with faith, and we today have promised the same. I usually tell folks who I'm going to hand the baby to beforehand, but I didn't get to come out here and ask, so I'm going to surprise Frank Manus and see if Frank would stand and take this sleeping baby boy as an example of a promise that we have made for the family. And let's take him back for us. <laughs> and Thomas will lead the way. <laughs> Yeah, Frank, Frank has two girls and has never held a baby boy before. So. <laughs> oh, and Frank says his parents' names were Ann and Paul. How fortuitous. And now members of the household of God, I commend William to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase his faith, confirm his hope, and perfect him in love. We give thanks. Pray. Almighty God, as a nation, we are at times like Israel wandering in the, in the desert. Help us move beyond grumbling and complaining to a place where we open our eyes to the manna that is all around. Where we are in pride, subdue it. Where we are in error, rectify it where we hold to that which is just and compassionate, support it. Lord, in your mercy. God, our provider, we come to you again and again and ask that you give us this day our daily bread. Through your grace, you so often give us more than we need. 
We give you thanks for all those who offered that abundance back to you by contributing time and goods and gifts to our church yard sale. May the friendships formed by those who worked at the sale be the fertile ground from which more loving ministries take root. May the proceeds of that sale bless many in your name. Lord, in your mercy. We praise you as one who offers love and joy and peace. And we thank you for the many in our church that pass on your love to others by taking time to listen to those in need. Strengthen all of us that we may live lives that testify to your power as the bread of life. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the sick, the suffering, and those who are sick at heart. We pray for Sue Link, who broke her arm, Webb Lewis, who was recently released from the hospital, for Anne Vermilia recovering from eye surgery, for a friend of our congregation, Dot Reynolds, who suffered a stroke, for Scott Arena's brother, Chip, and Susan Morrison's son, Patrick. Lord, in your mercy. This morning, we lift up to you, especially those who have suffered any type of abuse at the hands of those in whom they place trust. Again and again, for as long as it takes, show them that, the cross, that at the cross you entered into all our pain and that you always stand ready to comfort. Lord, in your mercy. From the abundance of your mercy, Lord, hear even these unspoken, unspoken prayers that we name in our hearts. Strengthened by your blessing, may we always be thankful to you and bless you with unending joy. And now we pray as our Lord Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven. Amen. Brothers and sisters, God is good. And all the time. I hope that those of you who are sitting in the pew near the center aisle will take time to find the Black Fellowship pad and sign your names to that pad and pass it down the pew. Those of you at the end, I hope you'll pass it back again so we can greet one another by name at the end of this service. And if you have a prayer concern, I hope you'll find the yellow prayer cards that are in each pew this morning so that we can pray with and for you if you place that prayer card in the collection plate today. I, I want to remind us of the two invitations that were made during the sermon. Indeed, this is a congregation whose ministry goes out into the world. I want to invite you to go out to our new property today. Today at 5 o'clock, the property we've purchased over the corner of Estes and Umstead. We're going to be digging in the dirt at the community garden that we have begun. So come with us at 5 o'clock today at the corner of Estes and Umstead. Bring a shovel, bring a hoe, let's dig in the dirt together. And two Sundays from now, let us come with food for our community. Food to offer around the communion table as on October 5th we celebrate World Communion Sunday. Indeed, this is a congregation whose ministry reaches out beyond itself. And I want to recognize Erin Hancock to come and to share a word with us. As she comes forward, I want to reintroduce Erin to you. Many of you know her already. Not only is she a graduate of the University of North Carolina, but also a very active member of the Wesley Foundation when she was here, the Wesley Campus Ministry. And Erin uh, was also one of the fundamental primary counselors for our youth group for several years. I'll let you go to the, to the pulpit to say a word. Erin has become a mission fellow for our denomination, and I've invited her to let us know how we can support her ministry over the next two years. 
Good morning, friends. Um, thank you all so much for allowing me to come and speak with you this morning. Um, as Carl said, my name is Erin Hancock. I'm a recent graduate of UNC Chapel Hill. And during my time at UNC, I was actively involved in the UNC Wesley Foundation, um, as Carl mentioned. In fact, I would probably not be standing here before you all this morning if it were not for the love, guidance, and support that I received from that campus ministry and this congregation as well. Wesley and this congregation have been have shaped me into who I am today, and like I said, have led me down this path of becoming a Global Mission Fellow. And it's a privilege to be back here this morning and share with you all about the ways that God is now working in my life as I embark on this next stage of my journey. So within the next couple of weeks, I'll be departing for a two-year placement in the tiny little island country of Grenada, which is located in the southeastern Caribbean. If you didn't know that, that's okay. I didn't about three months ago either. <laughs> I was given this placement by the United Methodist General Board of Global Ministries after committing to becoming a Global Mission Fellow of the United Methodist Church. So what is a Global Mission Fellow and what in the world am I going to be doing in Grenada? Well, Global, global Mission Fellows are young adults between the ages of 20 and 30 from all over the world who have committed to two years of service and mission in a location outside of their own home. There are 42 Global Mission Fellows in my class of 2014 and together we represent about 12 different nationalities and about 14 different languages. Each of us have been placed with different organizations around the world based on our own unique passions, experiences, and gifts. So based on my previous experience of working with the youth at this church, actually, Global Ministries has determined that I should continue on this path by planning and leading after-school programs for youth through an organization in Grenada called Grincota. Grincota stands for Grenada Community Development Agency, and it's a small nonprofit that works to provide resources and support to women, youth, and low-income workers within Grenada. I'm extremely excited about this opportunity and the ways that God is going to challenge and transform me throughout this next two years. So what also excites me is the chance to share with you all about this opportunity that I have. Like I said, I would not be where I am today if it were not for the people within this church, and I look forward to you all continuing to walk with me on this next step of my journey. There are a few ways that you all can do this, um, such as praying for me and the 41 other Global Mission Fellows in my class, reading and responding to my blog, and seeking ways to participate in this mission with me. Uh, for example, uh, Laura Knapp and I actually talked about the potential of getting the youth here um, at UUMC connected to the youth I'll be working with in Grenada, which to me is just a really exciting opportunity. Maybe pen pals or email buddies, whatever people are doing these days. Um, another way that you all can support me and the other young adults who are interested in these kinds of opportunities is through financial contributions. As a Global Mission Fellow, I'm committed to raising $6,000 for the overall program. And this money just makes it possible for the General Board of Global Ministries to continue providing these opportunities to young adults like myself. After the service, I will be um, at a table out in the parlor if you'd like to stop by and learn more about me, uh, my story, this program, um, the work I'll be doing, and how you can be a part of it. Thank you all so much for all of your love and support, and I look forward to talking with you more after the service. Thank you, Erin. Of the many programs Erin will be working in, not only will they be educating women and children, but also sustainable farming and some of the things that Glenn Coda does. It is wonderful to think that we can be connected to her for the next few years and extend our ministry to those areas. I thank you for helping support her ministry. If you want to do that, you may give according to the instructions in the insert, or we may be able to give just to the church with her name in the memo, and we will make sure it goes to her mission. Let us continue to give to God God's tithes, our offerings, our very selves.
So I don't always have the practice of looking in the offering plate as it comes up here, but I couldn't help but notice one of the little offering cards had a bunch of stickers on it. What a good and joyful thing it is that we can bring our creativity to God and celebrate that. We have lots of gifts throughout our congregation, like the display, art display that'll be on here, be in the hallway throughout the week, and the many activities from community garden to children's ministry. So much there is to, joy, to celebrate and to offer before God. But in order to do that, in order to thrive, we need to live by those simple principles that all have enough, and we get there by all having enough. All get enough so that all may thrive. Let us go from this place and give all God's creation enough. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.